Hi everybody, Michael Buffalo Smith. So happy today to have our dear old friend Roger Earl coming on the program. Roger Earl, the founding member of the great boogie rock band Fog Hat. And before that, drummer was of course Savoy Brown. And also a uh, very, very good wine man. Him and his wife Linda, they have Fog Hat Wine. And let me just tell you, it's wonderful. It's good. We're going to talk a little bit about that, too. Talk about the music. Talk about the wine. Talk about the good times. And uh, and it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Uh, I did want to say a big, huge thank you to our sponsor, our corporate sponsor, uh, Smith Injury Lawyers. Smith Injury Lawyers in Greenville and Spartanburg, South Carolina. And... Uh, if you need an injury lawyer, call them. Call Richard and the gang. Um, just dial 864-300-HURT. That's 300-HURT. And uh, you won't be hurting nearly as bad afterwards. <laughs> I promise you. Uh, check out the website at Smith Injury Lawyers PA dot com. That's our sponsor, and we are really thankful to these guys for helping us out a whole bunch. So uh, I did want to add one more thing. Um, I'm holding in my hand a copy of the most recent double vinyl album by Foghat, Under the Influence, a truly rocking album. As you can tell, this one is autographed by Roger and the entire band, Yes, that includes guitar player Brian Bassett and all of the guys. They're all just wonderful, and they're just some rocking guys. Uh, but this album is fantastic. And uh, I want you guys to know that somebody, somebody's going to win this very autographed album from me. All you got to do is subscribe to this channel the ambassador of Southern rock channel subscribe and I'll have your email address. And then you email me, you email me, uh, Michael Buffalo Smith, uh, at gmail.com. And you say, Hey, I entered and I will, you know, that way I will, I will have a record of it. And, uh, we will randomly select one person to win this. And if I can come up with some other prizes, we'll do that too. But we're going to start giving away a lot of things here on the on the program, on the YouTube official Ambassador Southern Rock channel. And this is quite special. So I hope somebody is uh, enjoys it that wins it. Be sure to enter. Be sure to subscribe 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 please ask your friends to subscribe to this channel we are trying to get a, a a good base of people i mean i'm very thankful for all the people who read the magazine and read my books and everything and if they would all subscribe to this channel we would be in good shape and we could uh put out a whole lot more content you know what i'm saying so anyway thanks a bunch and we will be back with Roger in just a couple of minutes. All right. Take it easy. Take a slow ride. Take it easy. All right. Yes, that's right. Here we are with Roger Earl. Roger Earl, thank you for coming on this uh, video program thing I've got going. I sure so nope. happy to have you back. And this is our, mine and your fourth conversation over the past 20 or 25 years wow no. the first, uh, first time we've ever done a video one though so that's pretty good yeah and uh you know my face was made for radio so maybe i was probably better off before i started doing this <laughs> uh but uh you're looking great you're looking fine you're looking chipper and uh it's good to see well, I had, this is the first summer i've had off since i was 12 years old Oh, yeah. Well, it, it wasn't by choice. Well, not by choice, no, but I've been getting lots of rest. 
Um, Linda oh, and I, Linda, well, Linda, Linda hasn't decided to kill me or divorce me, so, which is good. Well, that's good. Um, yeah, it's, it's been pretty weird in some ways, but in other ways, it's been fantastic because, you know, I'm not allowed to go out, you know, because of the COVID. It's like, you know, because I'm of that age. Yeah. And uh, though I do occasionally, I go up to fill, fill the car up with gas and put gas in the boat and uh, uh, get some food, stuff like that. But it's um, it's been nice. It's been like a vacation, um, which is, I feel kind of embarrassed saying that because I know other people have really, have really been, been suffering out there. But, you know, I haven't had a summer off since I was 12 years old. So it's been wow. kind of nice. It, it's been forced. Uh, I've been talking to the guys in the band and the crew that we had a, a Zoom a couple of weeks back with all the crew and all the band and we talked for a while. It was good fun. Oh, that's great. That's great. I, uh, yeah. yeah, I, uh, uh, I've heard that a lot from a lot of the guys I've talked to lately, you know, of the, uh, rock and roll bands and things like that there, you know, it's a, du a double edged sword, you know, and of course they hated the COVID thing, but it was, but it was nice to kind of get a little bit of a break and, uh, actually remember what their wives looked like. <laughs> you know, they did, a lot of them didn't get to see their wife, but you know, every couple of times, every couple of months or whatever. Well, fortunately, um, before Linda and I got married, even before we became more than good friends, we were friends since 1976, 75. Somewhere around there, Linda was our office manager, and we were always friends. Um, and then we became more than oh, friends. how nice! <laughs> and so but that's lasted. So uh, a bit of uh, advice from uh, a Roger or a drummer. I don't know if that's a good idea. Give it, getting advice <laughs> from a drummer. No, it's not a good idea. Marry if you're going to get married, marry your best friend. Everything yeah. else is dead. I think that's a, a good advice. Whether you're a drummer or not, it's a good advice. It really is. You got to be friends first because I mean, you know, at some point all the romance stuff may get less or even die away. But you, if you got your friendship, that's going to last forever. Yeah. Yeah. In um, fact, um, because I married Linda, my uh, first two wives have forgiven me. <laughs> <laughs> they wow. both love Linda, and all my ch and all my children have known Linda since uh, basically yeah, since they were born. So, and she used to babysit them from time to time, or they would come and hang out with Linda because she was a lot of fun. Uh, of so, it, it's worked out. It's worked out fine. I don't know if I deserved it, but I'm going to take it. <laughs> yeah, I would too. Well, let's go uh, back uh, a couple of years to. Uh, Give me just a little bit of a brief rundown. I mean, I know I've talked to you about these things before, but the audience that we're going to have on this is maybe people who don't know anything at all about you other than slow ride or whatever. So I wanted to get you to tell just a little bit about Subway Brown and that band and how you it morphed into Fog Hat or whatever, that whole thing. All right, we can talk about that. I might even be able to remember most of it. Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> if you can't, just make it up. You can. Uh, <laughs> I can make it up. I can make all sorts of shit up. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. 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 Do that. Just do that. Yeah. Okay. You should be. You should run for president then. <laughs> no, I'm not allowed to do that. I wasn't born here. Oh, but no, we, don't have, we don't want to go through that Bertha thing again, do we? Yeah, no, no, again. No. Yeah. No, 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 that was a waste of time. That was. <laughs> now, not to get political. Um, yeah, we'll talk about Savoy Brown. Won't get political, but I thought Barack Obama was a really cool guy. I thought he was a really cool man. Yeah, I yeah. like his wife too. Boy, she's great. She's intelligent. I read her book. Oh, yeah. I liked her book. Yeah, I've, I've got a book. We've read her book. It's in, it's on the coffee table. Um, right up there yeah and uh just the way um so they just seem like just really just decent people and like funny and intelligent and bright and caring yeah, um all right yeah uh, 
Oh, is is my is my favourite book. <laughs> <laughs> Shit happens. So hey, hey, you know, it's funny because if you weren't the drummer, I would ask for a drum roll. Uh, yeah. <laughs> on, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, there you go. Not? There you yeah, go. Right. Yeah, yeah. I've got a crazy pad here. I'm sitting at. I have an. I've got an electronic pedals and pad downstairs. I have my practice Remo pads upstairs and double pedals, and I've got my drums set up in my drum room outside. And so. And I've got a practice pad in the bedroom, which I sometimes have to move out of the way most nights. Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. Uh oh, it's getting a little risky. TMI, TMI, too much information. <laughs> so, anyway, somewhere along the line, Savoy Brown. Savoy Brown. Uh, yeah, uh, I was, um, I grew up in southwest London and, um, I, I was in I was in the, a band called that we had a, we had a couple of names but it was my school friends that I grew up with in from high school and we were first of all we were called the Tramps and we were the, uh, Camino Real and something else Ray Dorsett who was the lead singer in my first band that I was in became the lead singer of a band called Mungo Jerry that they his name is Ray Dorsett he formed with my brother Colin Earl and. Uh, I'm still good friends with uh, the bass player. We, we were best friends in high school, Dave Hutchins. And then, but work seemed to, we were a three piece, uh, but work got really uh, a bit slow in England. Um, that, it, was a, it was a time when like um, horn bands, you know, soul music was popular and a three piece, we couldn't, couldn't quite master that. <laughs> so uh, it got a bit short. I had a day job. I was a commercial artist, but um, I've read a, an advert in uh, the Melody Maker magazine. It said, bass player and drummer wanted for blues band. So uh, I said, aha, <laughs> that's me. Um, so I auditioned at a place called the Nags Head in Southwest London in Battersea um, with my friend Dave, who was a bass player. <clears throat> we didn't get the job that time. Somebody else got it. It was with Savoy Brown. Mm, this was with Savoy yeah. Brown. Uh, and uh, so then I got a call about three or four weeks later um, because we, we, the band I was in at the time was with the same agency as Savoy Brown. So I got a call uh, about three or four weeks later. The, the drummer they got, they didn't like because he couldn't play a shuffle. A shuffle is, you know, not that. <laughs> And he, could, he couldn't play that. So what kind of drummer is, is he doing in a blues band if he can't play a shuffle? What kind of drummer can't? Anyway, I grew up playing that stuff. Um, so I got a call uh, about three or four weeks later saying, you want to come back and audition? So I came back, I brought my drums, I borrowed my dad's car, and I was working during the day, as I said, as a commercial artist up in London. And it was around lunchtime and... Um, I set the drums up, it, it was at the Nags Head, which is like a, a club above a pub in Southwest London. And uh, got up there, we, we played for probably two and a half hours, well, maybe even more. And uh, they started packing up the drums and um, might have been Kim or somebody said to me, uh, where are you going? I said, well, I'm, I'm going back to work now. And they said, well, you got a gig in Birmingham tonight. And I went, oh. <laughs> So that was, that was how I joined Savoy Brown and I hung on to that seat for three or four years. Um, I had a great time. It was, um, it was a lot of fun. Chris Jordan, the lead singer at the time, was a fantastic songwriter. I had a great voice as well. Um, Kim was a great guitar player. Um, uh, became, obviously became good friends with Lonesome Dave. In fact, at the time, Dave was only singing one song in the set at that time. And then about, uh, we finished the first album that I was on, uh, Step Further. And then I think, no, not Step Further, um, Getting to the Point. And uh, then we had, uh, Mike Vernon, our producer, had, uh, had booked a, a gig for us, a, re a live recording date up in um, Leicester University. So we went uh, and we used to have a, like a transit van that we'd all pile into with all the gear and stuff. 
and we went to pick up Chris Jordan, our lead singer, and uh, he had a pain in the gulliver. So it was like, oh, but you know, we we're doing a live recording. Well, it's the stomach ache, it's a stomach ache you know, the gulliver's oh, travels okay. in it. Oh, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> and uh, so we're off, we're off to the gig and, it, and we're looking around and the only other person who sung at the time was Dave. And so Dave is sitting there going, oh, oh, he was, he was a fairly shy fellow, fairly reserved, except when he started singing. And uh, so he, and Chris Jordan had a deep voice and, and had a bunch of keys that probably Dave wasn't singing. Dave's voice was a little bit higher. Anyway, on the way up there, um, Dave learned a few of the traditional uh, Savoy Brown songs that we were doing at the time, like the Boogie, uh, uh, a whole bunch of like Muddy Waters stuff, Rolling and Tumbling and uh, Louisiana Blues, stuff like that, Hurts Me Too. And um, they made up, a, he, made, he wrote a couple of songs on the way up there. And that was Dave's introduction to the band. Um, it was one half of... Uh, the album and uh so when chris jordan left about a year later dave took over the vocals and um everybody gets their shot at some time or another what you've got to do is grab it with both hands and both feet if you're a drummer <laughs> yeah for real yeah. yeah yeah so uh transitioning from uh subway brown to fog hat just uh kind of a Give me the Reader's Digest abridged version of that. I know there's a lot to it, but just uh, kind of how that happened, because a lot of people are interested in knowing. We were, uh, well, actually, we, we, Savoy Brown was, was doing exceptionally uh, well, uh, being very successful over here in the States. And in fact, um, at the time, especially myself and Dave, you know, we loved coming here. It, coming to the to America was like coming home, as far as we were concerned. This is this is the land of music that we grew up listening to. You know, blues, rock and roll, country, uh, gospel, it's um, jazz. Um, there would be no music in the world if it wasn't for this place. So it was wonderful coming here. Anyway, um, we were having a really good time. The band was doing great. We were all getting. Um, we were getting paid 100 bucks a week. This is during 1969 through 1970, 71. And, uh, and last year that we were out on the road, we were getting between like uh, 10 and $15,000 a night, working seven nights a week, 100 bucks a week, wife and kids to keep come inside, you silly fella, come inside. No, it was like, uh, it was, <laughs> Dave and I were looking, we went, well, maybe it's time for a change. They had a new, uh, Savoy Brown had a new record deal coming out with uh, London Records. And um, it was just time for a change. We told Kim like, you know, what, uh, you know, whatever you need. In fact, we, we started work on the next album that Kim did, but until he got like, um, you know, his, a new band together. Um, it, it was quite amicable as far as Kim and I and, and Dave were concerned. But um, Savoy Brown's manager, uh, told us that if, if we left Savoy Brown, that we'd never work in the States or England again. Mm. What, a, what, a, what a piece of shit he was. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. But, but, but Kim and I um, stayed good friends th throughout that time. In fact, he, uh, he would get up and jam with us once, you know, Foghat got going. In fact, we're still very good friends. In fact, I talked to Kim. Yeah, uh, we t I talked to Kim um, about a week ago. You heard his new album? Yeah, yeah. I just yeah, wrote a terrific. review. Of, hey, boy, he keeps cranking them out, man. They just, their albums yeah, just keep them. It, it takes huh? us about two years to write an album. He does one every year, <laughs> and he's on his own. Actually, he has a, he has a really good band. The bass player and the drummer are, are really good players. Good people, too. His, his stuff uh, is consistently good, though. I mean, it really yeah. is. That new one is really good. I like it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great guitar player and his singing has come a long, long way. His songwriting is fantastic as well. I mean, how do you write that many songs? I don't know. He's good at it, though. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You want to go a little bit different direction, didn't you? My wife just reminded me that when I, we left Savoy Brown, we wanted to go in a different direction. <laughs> 
she, what would you do without Linda to tell you what, what to talk about? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I didn't know Linda at the time, but she would have probably sent me in the right direction. <laughs> in fact, yeah, Linda used to come and see us um, when we played the Fillmore and uh, New uh, oh. and, and New Jersey, right? Where we play over there in the Fillmore. I used to love playing there. Oh gosh, I would have loved to have gone to that place. I, I read about it, but uh, my age, it kind of fell at the wrong time for me to be able to drive all the way up to, to New York, it was, it was, to Fillmore. It, it was great, Fillmore East, Fillmore West. Um, yeah, great. Winterland uh, it, it, too, right? Uh, uh, yeah, Winterland, yeah, it was. Um, all of Bill Graham's it, things, it, man. It was he a just, promoter, Bill, Bill Graham. Yeah, Bill what was a, something. guy he was. Yeah, he, I read a whole a, book about him. It was just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah or, an oral, kind of an oral history where everybody was talking about Bill. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he was a little bit hard-nosed, but he got everything done. No, nah, he, uh, he was fine with the bands. So, well, as far as we were concerned, he always treated us like a bunch of little princes. Uh, whatever you want, you've got it. And even when we were opening up for other acts, Bill Graham was really cool with Fogat. Um yeah. Uh, in fact he, he there was a quote from him that, that he that we like to play more than we like to breathe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll was... tell you a quick story about the uh play the Fillmore Fillmore West and we were opening up for Frank Zappa. Oh my um, <laughs> yeah right but this is early days this is in our first tour nineteen seventy one or no seventy two I think maybe it's 72, I think. And I think it was at the Fillmore West or, or the uh, the other place that he had out Winterland. There. Either Winterland or Fillmore West, one of them. Anyway, Frank Zappa was, you know, in charge. I mean, Frank Zappa was huge then. Anyway, we, we get to the, it was a Friday and Saturday night we were doing. So Friday afternoon, we get there, we set the stuff up. Ainsley Dunbar, I think, was playing drums at the time. Great oh, yeah. drummer. Yeah. And uh, so... He's he's rehearsing his band for two hours, Frank is. And like, it's like, well, when are we going to get a chance to sort of like get a sound check in? Um, I mean, a two hour sound check. And, then, and, and it was like nonstop. I mean, he's up there conducting and doing stuff and they're all, uh, I go, wow, I don't think I'd make it in this band. I probably wouldn't have done. <laughs> anyway, that night, the Friday night, we got up, we did actually get on stage. I don't think we got much of a sound check. And for some reason, we nothing happened. I mean, the audience, there was no clapping, no cheering. There was no booing, but it was like dead. Oh. Um, uh, it, it was it was very, and anyway, we got back to the hotel. Uh, we all got together, probably in my room actually, and started drinking and other stuff. And, uh, few tears were shed about and then it was decided we're really gonna nail them tomorrow we're gonna get it tomorrow we did get in fact Frank did uh, rehearse his uh, band for another couple of hours but we got a sound check in and um, we did three encores so uh, oh. the second night so uh, it was something yeah um, so that was our start but Bill Graham I love Bill Graham he was um, he was very you knew what you were, you were doing and what you were getting with Bill Graham. He was a straight shooter. As far as I was concerned, of my knowledge of him, and any time I talked to him, he was great. He was terrific. Uh, he, was, um, he was a great promoter, and um, I loved him. I thought he was, he was something else. You know, something, that, Roger, that just ran through my mind, and I know it's probably inappropriate, but inappropriate is my other middle name. So I was going to say, <laughs> the first time I ever met you, and I know, I know for a fact, there's no way you could remember it, but I was just, oh God, how young was I? 1974, uh, I don't know, 15 or 16 years old, and Fog Hat opened for the Edgar Winter Group in Greenville, South Carolina. Okay. And I had never heard of Fog Hat in my life. And uh, I was always a big boy. So at the age of 16, I kind of uh, stretched the truth and told them that I was a reporter from the Greenville News. 
so that I could get, so I could get backstage. And uh, I wanted to meet you and, and Dave and everybody, and of course Edgar and all those guys. So I, you know that whole adage of uh, walk fast and carry a briefcase kind of thing. That's that's what I was doing. I was just pretending. But I got back there, and I remember, and I don't think I've ever told you this that I got to speak to you. And I just remember, yeah, but you were like the nicest guy I'd ever, I could not believe how nice you were because some of the other guys were kind of aloof, but uh, you were just like the most friendly cat. And I was like, that point on, I was like, okay, I'm a fuck up fan. The rest of my life, I I didn't know it was going to be this long. But <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be 50 years, but that's okay. That's fine. Uh, well, but you yeah, know, I, was, I just appreciated you being so nice, you know, to, to a stranger. But one of the things with drummers, see, I mean, I love my job. Now, if you're happy in your work, yeah. I mean, it's hard to work. I mean, I play. And I'm, you know, it's not a job. I, I play, <laughs> but it is a job. You know what the job is? The job is traveling. Playing that's the hard is part, like, yeah. Uh, playing is like the best. So, you know, I'm just this happy, rather fortunate soul who plays in a great rock and roll band, gets on great with his bandmates, and I get to bang shit and crash shit and kick things, like, and I get paid for it. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, you know, it doesn't I'm, I'm get much better than that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. I um, Yeah, I just wanted to say that publicly, though, that you... Uh, as far as, you. you know, you, you meet some uh, quote unquote rock stars and you got to admit at that point in time, uh, you guys were on the top. I mean, on the very top because Slow Ride was out. And I remember when the band played Slow Ride that night at the auditorium. Oh, those were the happiest days of my life. But they were playing, you started playing Slow Ride. That place just went completely nuts i mean completely i thought uh, edgar, uh, uh, the, i thought edgar was gonna michael, have to pack up and go back home and uh, michael the term is ape shit yeah exactly <laughs> it went it was nuts and i you know i was a huge edgar winter fan but i thought how in the world is he gonna follow this <laughs> and uh but it was just it was beautiful it was wonderful and um and i uh i just uh i just had a ball and hung out hunting out backstage and just walked around i mean i was like standing at the side of the stage while uh fog hat played and i mean it was like my first exposure that in fact i believe that day that night in 1973 september of 1970 september 3rd 1973 may have been the night i decided to be a rock journalist (laughs) <laughs> and it might have had a lot to do with Roger Earl uh, because I decided that, hey, these people are pretty nice. I think they'll be fun to talk to. Did I did I share my uh, alcoholic beverage and my drugs with you? No, no, no. <laughs> that would have been even nicer. No. Uh, at no, that no. point, at that age, I wasn't, I, I wouldn't have even known that, what to do with it. Um, not at 16, maybe two years later now. I would have been saying, Hey, you got any, uh, acid, uh, you know, and I, but it's like, yeah, yeah. Such a mean offend. <laughs> now I'm just, uh, now I'm just, uh, all I do is this. Oh, um, yeah, I'm drinking, uh, I'm drinking our Chardonnay. That's the Pinot, right? The Pinot. I, I can't, I, I swap them off. I love the Chard a lot. And, um, and the Pinot, and, and uh, well, you know, and also I like beer. So, oh, beer and a fog hat, and a fog hat koozie. You got to have Ooh. it in the fog hat koozie, or it's not as good. Have you have you tried the 2010 Pinot? I don't. What year is this one? That's the 2013. No, I have not. Um. I'll, I'll get Linda to send you one. Oh, great. But, you, you're gonna, but it is really fantastic. This, that we actually, Linda and I actually picked the grapes and actually, you know, punched them down and actually made that wine with you, our wine. You maker. did it yourself? 
Yeah, on the 2010. <laughs> and, um, it, and in fact, all the Pinots have really stood up well over time. In fact, I think they've got better. Um, you know, you've got to get them breathe for like, you know, three or four minutes. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, uh, well, sometimes you can like open the bottle and start drinking it straight away, which is what I do. But, you know, just to yeah. try and be vaguely civilized, it's like, well, no, let it breathe a little. Yeah, I've, I've heard that let it breathe thing. But being the person that I am, uh, it get, if it can't get its breath by the time it's open, then it's not going to get its breath because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be sucking that stuff down. It is lucky if it makes it to a glass and it's not straight out of the bottle. Um, yeah, yeah, a wino. Yes, I may be a wino. I might be, but yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit more in just a second anyway, but, uh, I wanted to go back to uh, fog hat for a second and talk about the, uh, yeah. The, uh, just a little bit about this, uh, I guess under the influence is the latest album that you've done, right? Yeah. 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 Um, it's come it's out a couple of years ago, but I, I was really happy with, and that we, we also, uh, had a producer on that album as well. Tom Hambridge. What a great guy he is. Tom. I, I like Isn't Tom. He? Yeah. Yeah. I, He's I, hung out with him at a, I hung out with him in a small club in Rome, Georgia. Uh, and he's yeah. a great singer and drummer and uh and that's, why, well, that's why that's why he got the job as producing us i said can you play drums he said yeah i said you got the job <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah wow well. yeah, no, I, I, I love i love tom tom's uh, a great uh great producer and he's terrific to work with as far as writing and getting stuff organized uh yeah, he. Um, you know, when you get a producer working with the band, it's like having, well, certainly for Foghat, it's like having a fifth member. Oh, it you is. join the band for the, for, for the duration of the record. Yeah. So yeah, Tom, Tom, Tom was thought George Martin was the uh, fifth Beatle. Fifth Beatle, right. Yeah, Though yeah. I, believe, I believe Jerry D. Lewis claimed to be the fifth Beatle. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did have a whole lot of shaking going on. I know that much. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, baby. The um. All right. Well, let me touch on this. I've got just a, two or three more little things here. Got to do a little shout out to your side band that I love, called Earl and the Agitators. Where are you guys doing anything now? Um. One. Uh, no. Well, one of the one of the problems is um. Uh. I'll I'll be perfectly honest and rather crass about it. Okay. Um, no, nobody wants to pay Earl and the agitators anything and, um, fog out, they'll pay huge sums of money. So it kind of <laughs> puts Earl and the agitators in their second spot. So the times that we have played, uh, what we do is we get the agitators to open up for uh, fog hat. Uh, and if Savoy Brown's on the band on the bill, uh, I'll be playing in three different bands. <laughs> Wow. Two of, them I don't, two of them I don't get paid for. Third one, I get paid for playing in Foghat, but I don't get paid for playing in the Agitators. Why is that? You know why? Because <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just love getting up and joining in with Savoy Brown and annoying Kim and his drummer. No, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, a great band. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's cool. Well, uh, the, uh, uh, I lost my place here. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll talk some more. It's not a problem. Scott. No, Holtz, okay. He, 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 shifting he, over, he, he, shifting back over to alcohol. Uh, <laughs> at some point here, I want you to drag Linda into the picture because uh, she should be in here when we talk about wine, just to add a little bit of beauty to the screen. No, I, oh, I'm, there I'm she the, is. I'm the wino here, not Linda. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah, but you got to have the boss in the picture, man. I can hold my own with the wine. She can hold her own with the wine. Yeah, well, I would. I I've heard that. I uh, <laughs> I heard that too. I heard that. I heard nice. that. <laughs> Only time I remember that time I was at the Blues Awards and you uh, you guys and we were all drinking wine and uh and I, I was like uh I think those two are the only two people I've ever seen that can out drink me. And uh, is that in, is that Memphis? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Memphis, way back when the Hall of Fame that, awards and all. That that's where we met uh, Tom Hambridge. In fact, that's, oh, really? Uh, that same time? Yeah, we met we met him in the bar at the hotel we were all staying. It was at. a great it was a great uh, weekend for me. I met uh, the singer uh, Keb Mo up there. Yeah, yeah Keb Mo, right? What right. a great guy! And I ran across blues guy Mark May that used to play with Dickie Betts and now he's a really hot blues artist. Uh, but man, it was just great. Everywhere I turned, I was running into people and, you know, I miss all that. I haven't been able to, even before the COVID, I've, you know, I had so many health problems. I really haven't done much traveling in the past three or four years, but I'll get back. I'll get back to it. I'll get back to it because, uh, so what I wanted to do was to just kind of, get you guys to talk about, tell a little bit about how you came to, to start doing this. Wow. When it went in, initially, uh, I think, uh, our cellar had run dry and I said, Linda, we've got no more wine. And she said, well, why don't we go it? <laughs> initially, initially <laughs> we played at the mid, mid uh, California. California fair in, pa fair in Paso Robles and our winemaker Steve Rasmussen who turned out to be our winemaker sent me an email and he and his winemaker his assistant winemaker were there at the show they worked with Tally Vineyards Quavo. Uh -huh. what was his name Quavo. Uh, I don't remember his name it'll come to me but so anyway he, he emailed me and said would you you've probably gotten this offer before, but would you be interested in making some wine? And we had just been talking about that because Sammy Hagar had just sold his Cabo Wabo to Cuba oh, yeah. Empire. You know? And we were at a hotel one night and we said, oh, we should get into the wine business. Very <laughs> timely. So we said, yeah. So we talked about it. We went out and met Steve and we decided to get into the wine business. We spent time in Central Coast and, um, we picked, we went out and we held. The first one was a 2005 cab, was yeah, it? Yeah, the first one was a 2005 cab. He oh. had the, he already had the wine, you know, in a tank of the wine. So we made like 90 bottles of From it. From Paso Robles. Just to see. And we did the label and um, we wanted to test the waters and see. So we did that and that worked out. So then we went out there and, um, we said, all right, well, we want to be, we want to learn how to pick the grapes. We want to be part of it. If we're going to get into wine, we want to learn all about it. Well, and we went out there. He thought, he thought we wanted a photo op, but we worked our butts off. And we were out there at seven o'clock in the morning. Our hands were bleeding, picking grapes, you know, like everybody. Actually, it was five in the morning. I think we had to get up. It was, anyway. it was early, but we learned every aspect of the wine business, you know, from picking oh. the grapes to down the grapes to we, we learned everything about uh wine making which was fun and try, yeah. we tried to make sure and when we were sorting you know the grapes especially pinots you've got to be either they're rather they can be rather delicate so we had to be careful when you were pulling like the dead snakes and the dead mice out of the grapes <laughs> you see what I like to put up? Yeah, well, uh, see, I, I like it because he's wha he's he's a wacky a little guy. Bit of protein. <laughs> I used to drive. I used to drive my wife crazy like that because it's everything. I made a joke out of everything, but God rest her soul. She's not even around anymore. She would. She would just be. Uh, she's like rolling her eyes all the time, you know. But, you did. You uh, lost your didn't you? That's hard. That's awful. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. 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 It was. Uh, it was but rough. Michael, there's one thing. There's one thing you mustn't lose, and that is your sense of humor and your uh, ability to at least poke fun at yourself as well. well I do, I do so, that on a consistent basis. <laughs> right. And I've always, Not you take know, uh, too seriously. Back in college, I came this close to uh, driving to Chicago and auditioning for the second city because I wanted to be like John Belushi and all those comedian guys because I've always improvised in fact, in college, my major was theatrical arts and improvisation. And it's so funny. I went through all that in school and I haven't done it now in probably 20 years. But anyway, all that about that. The, um, 
the thing I was going to say was, oh, look what I have. I've got my own official member of the way i've got this see i'm i'm all decked out for fog hat day it's official fog hat day now i've got this all wrapped around me and <laughs> but this is the uh see when you've got one of these official wine club things with your name on it oh there it is ah, there it is ah yeah and a picture That's of roger drinking then you know yeah, you've got on. something. Hang on to it. That could be worth something one day. Yeah, I got <laughs> it. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, I have my uh, collection of laminates hanging in there from all. In fact, I've got a fog hat one that you gave me on Rock Legends Cruise 2 uh, that's hanging in there. And I'm hoping that one of these days, fog hat comes around close enough that I can return to the scene of the crime and see you guys again some way uh i i don't know hopefully yeah, yeah, we, we, we met in the uh in one of the restaurants there and yeah. we talked for a while didn't we yeah exactly we, yeah we for a while there. i remember that mr brian was with us with you guys brian bassett and uh i'd always I love brian, brian because of all the way back to wild cherry i thought he was yeah. a great guitar player and then i knew him i knew of him when he was in the semi oh i'm on the radio i mean tv i can't say that when he was in molly hatchet right <laughs> i've got to be careful what i say because i forget i'm on video <laughs> yeah when he was in that fine and outstanding band molly hatchet but the uh yeah. but he's been with we've got tons of days together they're, they're great guys yeah yeah Fog has, he's been in fog out now how long a long time right 21 years well, 21 years with this incarnation and then four, two, three, three, three years with Dave's three band. Three years with Dave's band. And in yeah. fact, I'm, I'm, I'm totally indebted to Lonesome Dave for turning us on to uh, right. Brian Bassett because uh, when we put the original band back together um, and then uh, after In we 93. Uh, yeah 93, then we, we did Return of the Boogeyman with the original band. Then, uh, then Dave... Uh, uh, I had to take some time off to fight um, his cancer, and, um, and then it was time. And then he called me up one one day, and he said, I, "He said, Rog, um, we'd been off the road for like about a year and a half, I think, something like that." And he said, "Rog, uh, he said, uh, I, I can walk down to the gym and keep an apple down." He said, "I don't go in the gym, but I can walk down there and I can keep an apple down." He said, "I want to put the band back together." I said, "All right, no nice problem," time. and. Uh, so uh, I, I talked to Tony Stevens and we said, well, maybe we'll, we'll audition some, uh, well, you know. Rod didn't oh, yeah, Rod Price didn't want to go out on the road anymore. And I said, oh, but he didn't tell me, he told our road manager. And, uh, and I talked to David, I said, Rod doesn't want to go out anymore, according to our road manager. And he said, well, Brian will do it. I said, huh. I said, you want me and like, Tony to like audition some guitar players up in New York? Because this is where we were living. Dave was in Florida. He said, you can if you want, but Brian will do it. So knowing Dave as I knew Dave, it meant that our next guitar player was going to be Brian Bassett. And I am eternally grateful yeah. for Dave to turn us on to, to Brian. Brian is one of the most beautiful human beings I know. Yeah. He is an incredible slide and lead guitar player. He's also uh, our chief engineer, producer, everything that we do with this band. I don't think Dave really quite realized what he had when he found Brian, but I did. I, I recognized real talent when I met him and I said, I'm going to put you to work. <laughs> well, you know, since we're, since we're bragging so much on Brian, oh, we would be remiss not to mention your fantastic singer, Charlie. Uh, Charlie Hewn is that there's another one. Um, in fact, the first time uh, we'd actually done shows when he was in Ted Nugent's band, but I, I never met Charlie back then. Ted used to sort of hog the stage somewhat. Um, but uh, <laughs> yes, he we did. did we, we did a show in Cleveland, Ohio, and opening up for us was Humble Pie. Well, of course, Dave and I, you know, were real good friends with uh, Stevie Marriott 
from Humble Pie. But we did tons of shows with Humble Pie. Uh, I love Stevie. Stevie was, he was a special cat. Uh, anyway, um, so Dave and I looked at each other and said, well, let's go down and check this guy out. See what he's got under his fingernails. He's like, singing our mate Stevie Marriott songs and like, Anybody who could sing Stevie Marriott songs has to have a great set of pipes. So the band started playing. Dave and I were on the side of the stage and it, I don't know, maybe it was the position we were in. It didn't really sound all that good. Um, and, and then Charlie started singing and Dave and I both looked at each other and went, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> when, when Dave passed, he was, he was really my only real choice so I did get a lot of uh, tapes and cassettes and stuff sent but uh, the first three or four months I, I didn't really want to do anything at the time but uh, um, yeah Char Charlie Hewn uh, he's got a great set of pipes great guitar, it, great guitar player too but I'm gonna say but so he told our tour manager to try to find Charlie try to find the guy that was playing in Humble Pie that was singing so Michael found Charlie Roger talked to Charlie on the phone Charlie was interested, but he was working at Ford at the time on the assembly line. Oh. And Roger gave him 20 songs to learn. It was more than that, but well, yeah. maybe more than 20. And he got off, I said, isn't that a bit much? You know, and then he was gonna come here. And he said, he said, fuck it. If he's interested, I'll learn them. You know, if he wants to learn it, he'll, and, and he did. He, about what, two months later, he called us. He came to New York. They sat in the living room here. And he, he sat right there. He was right, just over there. Charlie Hewn is still warm. <laughs> he was awesome. He was Does it awesome. still have the smell yeah. of Charlie? Yeah. No, yeah. No, it's been 21 years. No, so no, actually, I, I cleaned the living room. So that would be, a, that would be something if it was still hanging on that long. Actually, uh, Charlie's very clean, actually. He's very clean. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I didn't say it was a bad smell now. No, no, uh, no. He's clean. He's clean. I've had he colognes that would last for uh, weeks. So, but no, the first time I heard Charlie was um, at the hmm, White Horse Mountain Music Festival in uh, Washington, and uh, and uh, the first time I heard him sing, it just my mouth just dropped open. I, I was thinking, this is one of the strongest rock and roll voices I have ever heard and i still feel that way i mean it's like just you know there's some voices that are i could count them on one hand the voices like steve perry and uh there's a few guys right. that voices just just kill me they're so good sammy hagar in rock and roll sammy right. hagar's right. voice just kills me right. so good yeah i mean yeah. all that kind of stuff but but charlie he's just you know he's one of the best and uh now who i'm sorry to be uh not to not know but who is uh playing bass now um rodney rodney okay. o'quinn you must know the that o'quinn boy <laughs> who rodney o'quinn rodney o'quinn he was he was with pat travers forever oh i and believe i met him years ago yeah um, in fact, what happened? With Craig McGregor was obviously our, our long time, yeah, long term player, but he also he got lung cancer and could only work sporadic gigs when <clears throat> when he wanted to, or when he could, I should say. And uh, and we had we had like three or four different bass players. Um, Danny, Miranda. Danny Miranda, great great bass player, plays with uh, BOC a lot. Um, who else? Um, uh, Dan Walters. Dan Walters, another great musician, actually. Dan Walters, friend of Brian's. Mm -hmm. But um, so it, until Craig McGregor told me that he couldn't play anymore, didn't want to play anymore, he was our bass player. So uh, what happened was Craig went to see Pat Travers' band because uh, uh, Craig was living in Pennsylvania at the time in uh, what was it? Why missing? And uh, there was a, a theater there that Pat Travers was playing at and Craig went to see him because he, he knew he was good friends with Pat Travers. We'd done tons of dates together over the years. And, um, and, the, and he, he spoke to Rodney 
and invited Rodney to come over his house the next day and have breakfast with him. Craig was a great cook, great cook, great chef, and could clean up as well. I miss him. <laughs> anyway, and then Craig called me up. Uh, anyway, he had he had, he had dinner with uh, Rodney, and then he and then he called me up. and He said, "Rog, you need uh, you need to get Rodney as a bass player. He's like a mini me." And I said, "Okay." So I went to see. Um, Pat Travers uh, with Rodney, they played out here on the island and he was a great bass player. But I didn't want to like, you know, take a bass player away from another band. So I talked to Pat, I think it was when we were doing one of the cruises, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And I, anyway, I, I talked to Pat and said, look, um, I'd really, uh, I'd really like to have uh, your bass player, Rodney in the band, but I want to talk to you first about it. He said, Oh, that's all right, take him. I don't need him. No, we don't. He didn't really. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said bass players, dime a dozen, Rod I'll get another one. Rodney worked it out. Uh, Rodney, Rodney, Rodney worked it out with Pat. And, um, and thank you, Pat. Uh, you know, Rodney O'Quinn is, uh, is another one of those wonderful, warm, sensitive human beings. <laughs> Um, is a great bass player, and, and another plus is he's only fifty something. What? Fifty two. He's only fifty two. So you know, when the rest of are, na are napping in the van or the, or the <laughs> truck or something, you know, Rodney's up driving or taking care of business and doing stuff. Um, There's another plus about him. What's that? Well, when he, he was, has a great voice too. Well, when he was with Pat, he was doing like all the management, tour management, bookings, and everything. So he gets my end of the business, which is really cool to have a musician out there that understands oh, what yeah. goes into doing everything, you know, and it's because a lot of times people just get, well, how come we're doing this? And how come we're doing that? You know, with <laughs> oh. hotel. Rodney gets, Rodney gets it. Rodney gets it. Yeah, he's cool. And also, he was also, he was also a big fan of Craig McGregor anyway. And, uh, you know, and having sort of watched him and hung out with him, it works. Um, yeah, we've been real fortunate. Actually, I've been fortunate throughout my whole career. I've always worked with great bass players. Uh, you know, Tony Stevens is a great bass player. A uh, human being, that's another story. Uh, stop it, Roger. <laughs> uh, no, terrific bass player. Um, and, and Craig McGregor, Nick Jameson. I, 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 and also the very first band I was in with my uh, high school friend, Dave Hutchins, a great, great bass player. And I think you know, if, if you work with really, you know, great musicians, you know, it helps. Um, I know it helps raise your game. You know, I, I always work with great bass players. So I think that oh, yeah. was, uh, I was fortunate in that regard. So, I mean, I'm not on any, any anywhere near your level, but I have recorded seven albums. And I told somebody yesterday, I said, my thing is I'm adequate songwriter and adequate singer and player, but I surround myself with all these guys, uh, most of them 10 years older than me, because most of them came out of the Capricorn Records, Southern Rock thing, you know, and they make me sound so good. <laughs> it's like, so I just, I've been very uh, fortunate like that myself, just to be surrounded by really top-notch musicians. I don't know how it even happened. It's almost like Forrest Gump, you know, where he just ended up with... <laughs> Ended up in situations. That's me. I, I like it. I'm in the studio now with the guy that played with Greg Allman. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, how did that happen? I don't know. It's just like it's writing the books, too. I mean, writing the books and stuff, it just kind of happened. And I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm happy about it. Hadn't made any money, but sure have had a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I... Good. Uh, it's it's not so much luck. I think it's good fortune, which I sort of tend to believe you have something to do with it. Because if you hear somebody, you meet somebody, and you go, "I think I could work with this this person." Yeah. Uh, I like look at something together. You know, something something clicks when you play together. When you you start playing. Like, um, same with with Charlie. It clicked straight away. With Craig McGregor, certainly for me, it clicked first time when he auditioned with Bobcat. Clicked straight away. Um, uh, you know, when I joined Savoy Brown, it, it, 
it clicks. Scott. And Scott and with, Howell, a, with the bass player, Scott especially, Howell you've got to have a good – drummers have to have a, a bass player that they can play with. I've seen it before. We, My drummer, before we were auditioning bass players, and we went through two or three, and they just didn't click together, you know. And then all of a sudden, one guy comes in, and it's just like magic, you know. So sometimes those things just happen. I don't think they can be even planned. You know, it just, it, sometimes it just works. Well, I, when uh, Craig was still alive, um, we, we would, uh, you know, back in like, uh, you know, the seventies when we were like hot and doing like, you know, 360 shows a year, we would, we would get, uh, I would get together in his room before we would go to the show. We would, we would always put on some music, um, like some, you know, some funky stuff or little feet or the brothers Johnson yeah. or something. And we, you know, we would sit there and we would talk about it and, and we would say things like, they'd be nothing without us. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, is not true at all. <laughs> but, uh, it, yeah, you know, the bass and drums. Uh, Craig had another thing. I love Craig. Craig was my brother by a different mother. Um, there was another thing he used to say. Um, he'd, he'd say, yeah, well, we laid down the road for them to all travel on. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Uh, he had all these, uh, yeah, I, I miss Craig. I loved, I loved him a lot. We were, we were all tight. I don't know if Linda wasn't in the picture when I was talking a while ago, but I, I, I did say at the beginning of the program, I already pre-recorded it, that I had, thanks to Linda, I had done some trade and uh, I had all these extra copies. This is my last one besides mine, and I'm giving it away on this show <laughs> to a. Uh, I have, if if you need another one, I have connections. Ah, well, one lucky winner is gonna. One lucky winner this time is gonna do. Uh, all they got to do is subscribe to this channel, and they'll be entered, and they can win. And I'll send it to them. I've got a mailer box. I've got it ready to go. They're not going to get this <laughs> because I'm drinking it later, but they can order. That's it. They can order fog hat wine. Am I correct? They can yeah, order yeah. fog hat wine and you can go to what's the website. Foghatsellers.com. And when you say sellers, you mean C E L L A R S. Yeah. Not right, that's right. Like Lots of people seller. go sellers. S E. No, no, it's not that. It's sellers. Wine sellers. Even if they go to our website, foghat.com, there's a link on there. Yeah. And go. I was going to say also they need to go to foghat.com for all things foghat rock and roll, and also oh, 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 buy all kinds of cool stuff. The, you know, the, the wine is delicious as well, and that's not just because yes, it is. you know it, it's ours. I mean, it's very drinkable. Um, I'm going to send you a, a bottle of the 2010 Frio. Please to, do, to please do. I'm, 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 Pinot, because you like the Pinot, and it's I fantastic. Like the, what is no, that? No, I'm a fool for the old. Pinot. I'm a fool for the Pinot. Oh, the, if you've been locked up in a bottle for ten years, you smell <laughs> a bit, right? Um, <laughs> so just let it air out a little. But it's a fantastic wine. Then the Chardonnay. Oh, look at that. <laughs> This is my girlfriend. Oh, you got your fog hat thing. Oh, my gosh. But this wow. is my girlfriend. Oh, no, my manager's back again now. So when we, when we made these masks, <laughs> and Roger and I wore them and put it, we, we have them on our website. Uh, yeah, it makes a nice hat, too, yes. What if somebody called us? It's almost like a yarmulke, sort of. Uh, somebody called us socialist, anarchist assholes. Uh, oh, and sl oh somebody great. Else called, somebody else called me a slave for wearing a mask. Uh, that's one of the few times uh, I've had that happen a lot here in South Carolina. Uh, well, our, our harmonica player. It's not about politics. It's, it's, it's about, you know, the sanity. Protect, protect, safety and protecting your fellow human beings. You don't want to get ill. Fine. But, or you do, you don't, you don't care, but it's the other people. Yeah. We care about other people. That's why you do it. All right. Enough of that. They're, they're, yeah. well, Linda, right, Linda, right. We're out in uh colorado a number of years back and uh, we were actually we were riding our bikes and uh, there was this record store that we found in this town and over the top there was 
this, these lyrics and it said, without music, life would be a mistake. And I said, I like that. Yeah, I do too. And uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry about I, Michael and, you know, all that <laughs> stuff, that, you know, and like, he kept interrupting me. And I was trying to tell you stories about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah, but, uh, I'm bad about it is, it. it is his show, so he, he yeah. gets to sort of edit that stuff out. 